Hello friends, myself Dr. Harmeet Goyal. I have done my MBBS from Lady Harding Medical College, post graduation in Ops Dhani from Sadarjan Hospital Delhi, and hospital management post from National Institute of Health and Family Welfare Department. I am into teaching for last 17 years. Today I am going to discuss the Jitmar PG 2020 June Ops Dhani questions. <coughs> You can get connected with me on my uh, Facebook Ops Gaini Discussion Group. You can follow me on Instagram and you can follow me on my YouTube channel with the name of Dr. Harmeet Goyal. So let us take up the first question today. Now this is a very, very simple and basic question. First sign of puberty in girls. So the options given. The option given are breast development, axillary pubic hair development, menarche and the growth spurt. Although this sounds simple, but many students make a mistake to mark growth spurt as the first sign, which is very, very wrong. Always the breast development is the first sign of puberty in the girls. And this is called as thilarchy. Thilarchy is the breast development. So you should not mark growth spurt as your answer. <coughs> Thilarchy, which is called as the breast development, the hormone responsible for thilarchy is the estrogen. Now, what is the correct sequence of puberty in the girls is thilarchy, pubarchy, and minarchy. Thilarchy is the breast development. Pubarchy is the axillary pubic hair development and minarchy is the periods. Thilarchy and pubarchy, these are called as secondary sexual characters. Secondary sexual characters. There are five stages for breast development and five stages for axillary pubic hair development. Name of this classification for puberty changes is Tenors classification. Okay, so tenors classification. Now, axillary hair appears first or the pubic hair. So, this is another important question. Always remember pubic hair appears first, then comes the axillary hair. Okay, and also remember that sequence of puberty is thilarchy that is the breast development then pubic hair then axillary hair then there is growth spurt and then finally there is minar so minarchy is the last one to appear. So just remember students, first sign of puberty is always the hilarchy and growth spurt comes just before the minarchy. So first sign of puberty never ever mark growth spurt as your answer. This is very, very clearly mentioned in your undergraduate textbook Shaws and it is very well mentioned in our postgraduate textbook Novak. And any article you study in gynae, it is always the hilarchy as the first sign of puberty and growth spurt comes just before the minarchy. What is the first sign of puberty in boys? Again, first sign of puberty in boys will not be the growth spurt. It is increase in the testicular size. Increase in the testicular size. Okay, so many questions I have mentioned here. First sign of puberty in girls is filarchy. Pubic hair appears first, then the axillary hair. Growth spurt comes before minarchy. And first sign of puberty in the boys is increase in the testicular size. Hormone responsible for puberty changes in the boys is testosterone. And in the girls, it is the estrogen. Filarchy, pubarchy are called as secondary sexual characters. And the classification used for puberty changes is the tenors classification. Okay, so we move on to the second question. 
according to the who what is the minimal sperm count who has given the changed criteria in 2010 so the options given in this question are 10 million per ml 15 million per ml 20 million per ml or 25 million so the correct answer is 15 million per ml this is a very very straight forward question and it has been asked in many exam including the nbp exam of 2019 okay so this is one of the favorite question next so what is the cut off value according to the who so in simplified way let me tell amount count mortality morphology okay amount is 1.5 million sorry 1.5 ml count is 15 million per ml mortality is 40% progressive mortality is 32% and morphology is 4% this value they have asked in the aims pg exam also okay so here students they have asked about the count so it is 15 million per ml also there is very very important question being asked in aims i remember 2016 and 17 which is the most important fertility indicator in the semen analysis fertility indicator is it the amount of the sperms count of the sperms mortality of the sperms or the morphology of the sperms so the answer is always the morphology of the sperms which is very very important indicator okay so answer to mark for the best fertility indicator is morphology of the sperms if that is not given then you can mark mortality of the sperms fine then you should be knowing about the this that is what is oligospermia what is azoospermia what is aspermia what is asthenospermia what is necrospermia what is teratospermia oligospermia is sperm count less than 15 million per ml previously it was 20 now it is 15 azoospermia is absence of sperms in the seed aspermia is no semen asthenospermia is decreased mortality necrospermia is dead sperms teratospermia is abnormal morphology ठीक है abnormal morphology okay so structure of the sperm sperm has got a head acrosomal cap middle piece and the tail so the mor morphology of the sperm should be absolutely normal So in this question, the answer was 15 million. Most important fertility indicator in the semen analysis is always the morphology of the sperm, which should be normal. Now proceeding to the next question, a 28 year old lady comes to the infertility clinic with FSH high and estrogen reduced. What would be the probable diagnosis? Many students have posted question on my site and they have sent me on my WhatsApp. Okay. some are saying there was only high fsh given estrogen was not there some are saying no even estrogen was given okay whatever it may be so it's a high fsh and decreased estrogen okay let's see the options given options are tubal block anovulation hyperprolactinemia or premature ovarian failure tubal block has nothing to do with the hormonal status okay tubal block you find on hsg which is an important investigation 
in infertility patient and you check about the uterine pathology, you check for the tubal patency, etc. Now, looking at other options, anovulation, hyperprolactinemia, premature ovarian failure. Well, students in my classes, in my uh, teaching for the NEAT PG, NB pattern, FMG, or for the AMS PG, I have always mentioned when there is high FSH and estrogen is down, it coincides with premature ovarian failure. Okay? Now, let's just rule out other options. Anovulation. Anovulation, there is high levels of estrogen and important cause of anovulation is PCOD where estrogen is high. So as a negative feedback, FSH is down. So this again does not go with the question. Hyperprolactinemia. In the question, they should have written the history of galacturia or they should have written serum prolactin levels more than 25 nanograms per ml. Something or the other history should have been there. Okay. Moreover, if the prolactin levels are high, they suppress the release of FSH. There is uh, anovulation. There is uh, secondary amenorrhea. There is infertility. So, cabergolin is a drug of choice for hyperprolactinemia. Again, in this case, there is high FSH. So, hyperprolactinemia is also ruled out. Now, what is premature ovarian failure? Premature ovarian failure means ovarian failure occurring before the age of 40 years. Okay. Now, what is the pathology in the premature ovarian failure? What happens from the ovary? There is no dominant follicle. There is no ovulation and estrogen progesterone levels are down. So there is no negative feedback inhibition caused by estrogen and progesterone from the pituitary. There is secretion of high FSH and high LH. So this will not stimulate the ovaries, rather it will suppress the ovaries because a pulsatile secretion of gonadotropins are being required for ovaries to function normally. Okay. So many times in the AIMS PG exam 2015 and 2016, there's a question asked, what is the investigation for premature ovarian failure? So the answer is FSH more than 40 milli international units per ml is what is premature ovarian failure. This is very, very important. Okay. So you should remember for the NEET PG upcoming exam also. Now, normal FSH is between 10 to 20 milli international units per ml. Fine. Now, what can be the causes for premature ovarian failure? So it can be idiopathic, there is hereditary predisposition, or there is genetic, or there is some surgery being done, or there is radiotherapy, chemotherapy, turner, etc. So many reasons for premature ovarian failure. Now, what is the treatment of infertility in case of premature ovarian failure? In single line, it is IVF using donor oocytes. IVF using donor oocytes. Remember this for further exams. This is very, very important. Now, what is to be done? Let me just mention in short. Uh, there is a donor female, healthy female. And from there, the oocytes are being retrieved by doing a transvaginal scan after giving her the ovulation induction. And it is fertilized with the husband's sperm. And IVF is done. And embryos are ready. In this female, we give her estrogen followed by progesterone so that endometrial lining can be formed. After that, a transvaginal scan is done to check the endometrial thickness. Once the endometrial thickness is appropriate for implantation, this embryo transfer can be done. And the pregnancy support in the first trimester can be done by progesterone. Because from the second trimester onwards, the full flesh placenta is formed, which takes over the function of uh, the placenta to form the progesterone. Sorry, the uh, ovaries to form the progesterone. So in this question, just remember 
the answer to this question is premature ovarian failure and important points are mentioned here in premature ovarian failure is the definition of ovarian failure occurring before the age of 40 years there is high fsh high lh one answer to mark it is fsh more than 40 million international units per ml and the treatment of infertility is ivf using the donor two cells coming down to the next question Treatment of stage 3B cancer cervix. This is a very, very important question and it is a repeat question. It's already been asked in AIMS PG 2010, 2011, 2012 in the NEET PG many exams. So let's see the options. It is radical tracheolectomy, chemotherapy and radiotherapy, modified radical hysterectomy or total abdominal hysterectomy with bilateral salping of infection. So I think everybody knows this answer. The answer you should mark always is concurrent chemo radiation. Concurrent chemo radiation. And students, the radio sensitizer drug is cis platinum. Radio sensitizer drug is cis platinum. Fine. So, just remember the stage-wise treatment, there is a FIGO staging which has been followed, stage 0, when the fertility is needed. So, the treatment is LEAP, which is loop electrosurgical oxygen procedure, which is considered to be the best, or there is sponization, which has been available. Some people recommend cryosurgery also, but the best answer according to me is the leap. If the female is menopausal age group, then hysterectomy will be the better answer. For stage 1A1, okay, it is hysterectomy. If the patient is unfit for surgery, then radiotherapy. For stage 1A2, it is again the hysterectomy, that is surgery. If the patient is unfit, then radiotherapy. Here you have to do lymph node removal. So a radical hysterectomy is being recommended. If it is stage 1B or 2A, where it is less than 4 cm lesion, then it is radical hysterectomy. And maybe post-operatively, because of the lymph node status, the teletherapy can be given. Or if unfit, then radiotherapy. In case, if there is bulky lesions in stage 1B and 2A, or we say more than 4 centimeters, then chemo radiation is the one which is being preferred. So you see up to stage 2A we go for surgery and rest of the stages we go for concurrent chemo radiation. So stage 2B, stage 3, stage 4, concurrent chemo radiation. Concurrent chemo radiation. So let's move on to the next question. Not required in the diagnosis of PCOS. PCOD is always a very, very important topic. In every exam, there's a question being asked on the polycystic ovarian disease. PCOD, the incidence has been rising because of the, so much of the genetic factors, the environmental factors, the changes in the pattern of the lifestyle, etc. And good thing is it is most predictable cause or reversible form of infertility because we have to give the ovulation induction agents. Now let's see what are the options given. Hirsutism, oligomenorrhea, insulin resistance and uh, ovarian volume. Ovarian volume more than 10 uh, uh, millimeter cube. Now PCOS, always the most common cause of hirsutism in the young female. PCOD is the answer you should mark, provided that the other etiologies you have ruled out, like congenital adrenal hyperplasia, Cushing syndrome, uh, then uh, adrenal tumor, ovarian tumor, etc. So, hirsutism is always an important criteria. Oligomenorrhea, that is menstrual disturbance, again is an important criteria. 
ultrasound showing the ovarian volume is also considered but insulin resistance although seen but that is not included in the criteria so according to me the insulin resistance is the answer which you should mark now in pcos whether you follow the rotterdam criteria or you follow the previous criteria or there is another criteria like ashray's criteria ashray's criteria there is hyperandrogenism that is hirsutism biochemical or the clinical finding there is menstrual disturbance which is oligomenorrhea amenorrhea or anovulation and polycystic ovaries on the ultrasound so everywhere this is the one which is the criteria be followed so whether you follow the rotterdam criteria or any other criteria ashray's criteria rotterdam has given in 2003 okay so it says there is hyper androgenesis lab findings or clinical findings lab findings or clinical findings so clinically it is hirsutism or there is acne or there is androgenic alopecia okay so hyper androgenism presents with hirsutism or there is acne or there is androgenic alopecia or the lab finding there is increased levels of testosterone there is increased levels of dihydroepiandrosteneidion then there is an ovulation leading to menstrual disturbance like oligomenorrhea or secondary amenorrhea then ultrasound showing polycystic ovaries any criteria you follow they say two out of the three should be there for pcod so hyperandrogenism and ovulation ultrasound in the ultrasound nowadays ashel ashtray's criteria it says tvs is better to tell about the polycystic ovaries so it is more than there should be 12 follicles per ovary and each should be 2 to 9 mm or in the uh, rotterdam criteria they measure uh, the ovarian volume more than 10 ml fine so this is also included so nowhere insulin resistance is been mentioned nowadays the ultrasound done for pcod is called as pcom polycystic ovarian morphology on tvs okay so i hope i have made myself very very clear so insulin resistance is the one which you rule out in my subsequent video on the demand of the students i will be soon releasing a video on the youtube on the polycystic ovarian disease which where important pathophysiology important markers important investigation important treatment i will be discussing it there now next question is carl exner bodies are seen in that is very very straight forward question and i remember in the neat pg when it started uh, when the dnb started taking neat pg in 2012 this was a straight question being asked so it is not in fibroma not in fibroma not in uh, mucinous tumor the correct answer is granulosa cell tumor okay so collexner bodies are seen in granulosa cell tumor granulosa cell tumor is a sex caught ovarian tumor and it is feminizing in nature feminizing means it is estrogen secreting in nature granulosa cell tumor can occur at any age group when it is occurring before puberty it causes precocious puberty precocious menstruation when it is occurring in the reproductive age group it will cause menstrual disturbance when it is occurring in the menopausal age group it causes post menopausal bleeding and the lady will be at risk of endometrial and breast cancer okay 
So granulosa cell tumor, which is feminizing ovarian tumor, that is estrogen secreting, it's the sex cord ovarian tumor. It can occur in any age group, so it will cause precocious features, menstrual disturbance, or postmenopausal bleeding. The tumor marker for granulosa cell tumor is inhibit. Tumor marker for granulosa cell tumor is inhibit. Now, some of the images I'm just focusing it here. This is called axonar bodies that is seen in granulosa cell tumor. This is calcified bodies, which is samoma bodies. Samoma bodies is seen in serous tumors, which is epithelial ovarian tumors. This is very, very significant. And this is Schiller dual body. Schiller dual body, which is seen in yolk sac tumor. Yolk sac tumor is germ cell tumor of the ovary, which is rapidly growing ovarian tumor. So Schiller dual body is yolk sac tumor. Samoma bodies is the serous tumors and call axonar bodies are in the granulosa cell tumor. Image-based questions in the NEAT PG, this is again important. Now, signet ring cell. Signet ring cell, the cells are like this. So this is seen in Krukenberg which is metastatic ovarian tumor, metastatic ovarian tumor. Next, what is the karyotype of complete mole? This is again a very, very favorite question. Many times in the AIMS PG, NEET PG, FMG exam, this question has been asked. And always remember that H mole is of two types. That is complete mole or partial mole. Complete mole is diploid and partial mole is triploid. Complete mole, 90% cases, it is 46XX. 10% cases, it is 46XY. And partial mole is triploid, 69 X or 69XYY or XXY, whatever it may be. Okay, so that is it. So again, I think it is a very, very straight question from the H-mole topic, okay? So let's proceed with the further question. Most common cause of death in cancer cervix patient, it is very straight question, it is uremia. 60% of cancer cervix patient die of uremia, that is renal failure. Okay, so even in the final year MBBS, this was taught to us in Lady Harding Medical College that the most common cause of death in cancer cervix is always renal failure because of the metastasis occurring to the kidneys, leading to shutdown of the renal system, rise of urea, leading to drowsy, disoriented behavior, and finally death. So this is very, very straight question. Next. An obese lady is diagnosed with PCOS. What would be the first line of management? Obese, PCOS, first line of management. OCPs, lifestyle modification, metformin, spironolactone. Always, always there is so much of the workshops been going on on PCOS. So many articles are there, okay, so many studies have been there and it is always recommended in case of obese female or PCOS patients, if there is 5 to 10% of the total weight reduction by, uh, by following the healthy lifestyle or lifestyle modification, naturally it will help okay in decreasing the androgen levels which is leading to hirsutes leading to acne alopecia that is androgenic dependent alopecia or 
Increased androgen also has the suppression effect onto the ovaries. Okay, so all this will get corrected because androgen levels are decreased in weight reduction. Plus insulin resistance, which is being increased. So it keeps a check on the insulin levels also. Plus when all these factors are happening, automatically the ovarian function improves. Fertility is also being resumed in some of the cases because in PCOD when the androgens were high, the fasting insulin was high, they were having a suppression effect onto the ovaries and ovaries were releasing more of the androgens and from the other sides because there was a thicker cell hyperplasia being happening. So automatically the LSFSH ratio gets corrected and all, so it has proven the markable results. Whereas OCP is metformin spironolactone. It may be needed, but as in this case, it will be a second line. First is always the lifestyle modification. Go for brisk park, walking, do some exercises, uh, change the eating, avoid the fatty and carbohydrate rich food, include more green leafy vegetables, use more uh, intake of the uh, liquids and all that. Fine. So sugars, fats, junk foods also to be avoided and time to time, you know, like uh, the eating habit should be there. So much of the intake of the meals, heavy meals should be avoided. So that is what is our lifestyle modification, fine. The OCPs works, it corrects the menstrual disturbance, which is caused in PCOD. OCPs are recommended in those which has hirsutism or acne because it increases the sex hormone binding globulin so that the free testosterone levels which are there, which is causing the problems, they can get bound and the effects will be reduced. Also, it inhibits the 5-alpha five alpha, five alpha reductase activity. 5-alpha reductase activity is also been reduced by spironolactone, which is an antihistamine drug. Metformin corrects the insulin level. So that comes as the second line. First is the lifestyle modification. Next, which of the following is not a cause for ferning pattern of the cervical mucus? This we have been studying from the ambiguous time. Ferning of cervical mucus is caused by estrogen. Okay. There are two basic hormones secreted by the ovaries, the estrogen and the progesterone. Estrogen acts on the cervical gland and leads to profuse secretion, profuse and abundant secretion of the cervical mucus. And if you make a smear on the slide, you will find ferning of the cervical mucus under the microscope. Why there is ferning? Because estrogen causes crystallization of the sodium chloride which is responsible for ferning. On the other hand, progesterone makes the cervical mucus thick and scanty. So ferning gets lost. So in this question, I would mark high progesterone levels not cause ferning. You see this is the ferning pattern of cervical mucus under the effect of estrogen, sodium chloride, etc. Next. All of the following are the risk factors for endometrial cancer. Even I have discussed this in my uh, video of the AIMS PG exam. But again, this is a question being asked. This is a very, very important question being asked in many of the exams. Fine. So we know all this risk factors for endometrial cancer are all. Okay. Infertility. Yes. Tamoxifen. Yes. Obesity? Yes. OCPs do not increase the risk for endometrial cancer. Rather, OCPs reduces the risk because it suppresses the release of FSH, LH. So, androgenous estrogen from the OVs are suppressed. Okay. So, the risk factors for endometrial cancer includes nulliparity, infertility, polycystic ovarian disease, hormonal replacement therapy, early menarche, and late menopause, 
feminizing ovarian tumors like granulosa thicker cell ovarian tumors endometrial hyperplasia especially the risk is atypical endometrial hyperplasia then obesity diabetes hypertension tamoxifen and lynch to syndrome which is hnpcc hnpcc hereditary hereditary non polyposis colorectal cancer syndrome so nally parity infertility pcod hormonal replacement therapy early menarche late menopause feminizing ovarian tumors endometrial hyperplasia obesity diabetes hypertension tamoxifen and lynch to syndrome so know where it is the ocps okay also remember this lines about ocps ocp gives protection against benign breast diseases ovarian cancer endometrial cancer choriocarcinoma and colorectal cancer benign breast diseases ovarian cancer endometrial cancer choriocarcinoma colorectal cancer ocp is known to increase the risk for adenocarcinoma cervix ocp can cause hepatic adenoma ocp neither cause nor protect against breast cancer that is what is a cancer textbook novat says okay so ocp is protect against endometrial cancer hence ocp you will mark as the answer in this question next markers antenatally checked are antenatal that means they are talking about a pregnant lady let's see alpha ketoproteins beta hcg anti mullerian hormone and inhibin alpha ketoproteins beta hcg inhibin are the markers checked antenatally and they are asking you aneuploidy markers anti mullerian hormone is not done in the antenatal period we usually do it in the gynae cases whereas others are in the obs cases simple to remember okay now in case of aneuploidy the first trimester markers are beta hcg and pap papa is pregnancy associated plasma protein beta hcg rises papa decreases and you combine it with a 11 to 13 weeks ultrasound for nuchal translucency this is first trimester screen this question has been asked in aims pg exam 2015 also okay now in the second trimester there is a triple test and there is a quadruple test triple test is done 15 to 18 weeks quadruple test is done 16 to 18 weeks markers in triple test are alpha ketoproteins proteins beta hcg and estriol okay so this is for trisomies these markers are done for trisomy like trisomy 21 downs trisomy 18 edward trisomy 13 patau syndrome okay quadruple apart from this alpha ketoproteins proteins beta hcg and estriol there is fourth marker which is inhibin a okay so these are the markers done in the antenatal period for anu plug so here alpha beta proteins beta hcg inhibin these are the markers for antenatally check markers now talking about anti mullerian hormone anti mullerian hormone anti mullerian hormone it is been secreted by granulosa cells of the ovaries in the females 
and it has been secreted by Sertoli cells in the males. This question has been asked in 2019. Anti-mullerian hormone in the male has been secreted by answer Sertoli cells. So in the Sertoli, uh, in the males, it inhibits the development of the mullerian system. So this hormone is secreted in the intrauterine life itself. Whereas in the females, it is in the puberty age group. And anti-mullerian hormone is an important marker for ovarian reserve. It is the best investigation to check for the ovarian reserve. Ovarian reserve means number of resting follicles in the ovary. So anti-mullerian hormone, less than 1 nanogram per ml. This means there is poor ovarian reserve. So in that case, the patient of infertility is taken up for IVF using the donor cell. Fine. So anti-mullerian hormone is marker for ovarian reserve. Next. Investigation to detect superficial peritoneal endometriosis. I think everybody knows the answer. Laparoscopy <clears throat> is the gold standard investigation for endometriosis because it is diagnostic as well as therapeutic. Diagnostic as well as therapeutic. Ultrasound, you can just check the chocolate cyst of the ovaries. CA125 is a non-specific marker which is elevated in endometriosis. CEA again. So the answer to this question is laparoscopy. And I have taken the image so that you can understand. This is the laparoscopy image and it is showing the endometriosis here. The brown color endometriotic spots, the adhesions of the peritoneum, there is velvety lesions, etc. So all this can be picked up by laparoscopy and it can be treated by laparoscopy using the laser, uh, the adhesiolysis or destruction of these implants by laser or the pot. Next, all of the following decrease the sperm motility except options, driving for long hours, prolonged abstinence, smoking, uh, long standing. Some people are saying long standing was given in the option. Some uh, people are telling running was given, whatever it may be. Always we know that from the textbook of Shaw's and all, when we deal with the male infertility, we take the history, we do the examination, and then we send for investigation, similarly in the female, okay? So we always take the history of the occupation. If the person is a driver and they are driving for long hours, the perineum is exposed to high temperature, high temperature, okay? So if they are driving for 20 hours, 24 hours, the wider testis lies outside the human body because it requires a cool temperature for spermatogenesis to take place. So if the perineum is exposed to high temperature, that will lead to male infertility at times. Smoking, the alcohol intake is a very, very important factor for male infertility as it can affect the spermatogenesis. It can cause decreased blood supply, vasoconstriction, blood supply to the, uh, to the testes, to the vast difference in all that uh, is decreased and that can affect the spermatogenesis process. Even the alcohol intake, chronic alcoholics, they have erectile problems. There are certain drugs like antipsychotic, beta blockers, uh, excessive use of the testosterone, anabolic steroids by the bodybuilders, all can lead to the male infertility prolonged abstinence sometimes. So I would mark long standing or the running does not affect the small motility. Okay. Now young female, married female presents with amenorrhea and pain abdomen. All of the following you will suspect except amenorrhea and pain abdomen. Okay. So options are ectopic pregnancy, dysmenorrhea, cryptomenorrhea, endometriosis. Dysmenorrhea students is always a painful menstruation. So it is never being associated with amen. Okay, so the clear cut answer is dysmenorrhea. Whereas ectopic pregnancy, there will be amenorrhea plus pain abdomen classical pride. Okay. Cryptomenorrhea is can be acquired or congenital. There will be primary amenorrhea. Pain, abdomen, 
there will be suprapubic bulge etc and the cause can be imperforate hymen or it can be acquired cryptomenorrhea where there is conization or there is Manchester operation which leads to cervical stenosis leading to secondary amenorrhea and impotability. So cryptomenorrhea can be primary or secondary but amenorrhea and pain abdomen will be seen. Endometriosis. Endometriosis, chronic endometriosis because of chronic anovulation leads to secondary amenorrhea, pain or congestive dysmenorrhea or chronic pelvic pain or dyspareunia. These are the important features of endometriosis. So in this question, we should mark dysmenorrhea as the answer. <clears throat> Next, which of the following you would follow in the practice to reduce the incidence of uterine prolapse? Well, friends, the options given are hormonal replacement therapy, advice, proper nutrition from childhood to menopause, advice, postpartum exercises, prevention of prolonged second stage of labor. Whenever we were given any case discussion during the third year of ambiguous or in the final year or during the PG, always we used to take the history in cases of genital prolapse, the history of home deliveries by the guide. So there is always a history of prolonged second stage of labor in the hospitalized deliveries or delivery by the trained personnel if there is a long second stage it can be cut short by the forceps or the vacuum so we never allow the second stage to be prolonged so this is important step post delivery exercises which is called as eagles exercises these are advised and even the recommendation is to tone up the uh, must uh, the tone up the perineal muscles or it increases the tone of the perineal muscles it can be advised even from the third trimester itself now proper nutrition uh, definitely it has a role hormonal replacement therapy has nothing to do with the prevention of genital prolapse which of the following is not an indication for emergency cesarean section well different places i have got different answers so fetal distress Cord prolapse, these are the indications for emergency cesarean. Among the two, oligohydramnios and CPD. If we go like this, oligohydramnios. Oligohydramnios is when amniotic fluid index is less than 5 centimeters or the liquor pocket is less than 1 centimeter on ultrasound. Usually, we allow labor to proceed. Okay. And it goes uneventful. But and proper NST or CTG monitoring is being done during pregnancy itself. The Manning score or the NST is being done to keep a check on the oligohydramnios patient. And during labor, CTG is being done, cardiotopographic, which is a relationship of fetal heart rate to uterine contractions. If there is any dip in the or any deceleration appearing, then that patient can be taken up for an emergency cesarean section. CPD. If in the question CPD in labor is written, then answer to this question, oligohydramnios. Otherwise, CPD, there can be an elective cesarean section which can be done. Okay. So what is the option given in the exam? Accordingly, we can mark the answer. Now, 35-year-old female presents with painless vaginal bleeding in the third trimester. Third trimester was given or the weeks of pregnancy is given. What is not to be done? So painless vaginal bleeding is placenta failure. Okay. So abdominal examination is recommended because you want to see there is any uterine contractions. You want to check the fetal heart rate. You want to check uterus is tense for tender tense and tender uterus goes in favor of abruptio placentae. Ultrasound also can be done. A bedside ultrasound can be done. You don't have to send the patient to the radiologist for the ultrasound, but you can do it at the bedside of the patient itself. IV fluids in a bleeding patient, always it is recommended. But undiagnosed case per vaginal examination in a placenta previous suspected case is always, always complying with. So, per vaginal examination is nowhere recommended. Next, which of the following is not sling operation in case of genital prolapse? Not a sling operation. 
sling operation friends is done in case of nulliparous collapse nulliparous collapse means only cervical descent no cystocele and no rectus so sling operations we already know that purandre was the initial man who did this operation so it is named after purandre's abdominal sling then there is shivorkar sling operation shivorkar operation is different khanna's sling operation manchester is not a sling operation manchester operation is done in a multiparous lady with genital prolapse uh with cervical descent present cystocele present rectocele present and in manchester there is amputation of the amputation of the cervix which has been done and strengthening of the cervix by tying the cut ends of the mackenrod ligament making the new os with vaginal flaps and followed by pelvic floor repair so manchester operation the complications are if there is a cervical stenosis it can lead to cryptomenorrhea and infertility if there is a uh, cervix left dilated it can lead to cervical incompetence leading to second trimester abortions so manchester operation uh, is uh, recommended in those female who want to preserve the uterus for the menstrual functions as far as most, most of the gynecologists they advise manchester operation if their fertility is to be preserved then it is not a very very good idea to do the manchester operation rather shivorkar should be done in that case so manchester is a place in london where this operation was done and this operation is also named after father gill which was the man who did this operation first so it is manchester operation or father gills the pair so here the answer is manchester next three words but case test was positive baby has hepatosplenomegaly what is the diagnosis abo incompatibility spherocytosis erythroblastosis fetalis or chronic fetal maternal hemorrhage three words but case test hepatosplenomegaly clear cut this is erythroblastosis fetalis now what is three words but case test three words but case test is based on the principle of acid elution in this we take a blood sample to be tested on a slide and we add citric acid phosphate buffer and what do we see under the microscope that the dark pink color cells that is bright red or pink color cells these are the fetal cells which is hemoglobin f hemoglobin f resists acid elution so they are intact there are maternal cells they got hemolyzed because they contain adult hemoglobin so three words but case test you see another slide this is actually looking this is the hemoglobin f hemoglobin f which is fetal cells and this hemolyzed is hemoglobin a which is maternal cells so clean was the but case test is actually done where in case you want to give the ntd immunoglobulin to the rh negative mother to protect the future pregnancies because you want you don't want that any fetal rbc which is rh positive fetal rbc which contains the antigen if it enters into the maternal circulation it will cause antigenic stimulus and the antibodies are produced in the mother against the fetal cells and which will cause molestation so cleavers but case test is the test for fetal maternal bleed and you want to check the amount or dose of immunoglobulin ntd immunoglobulin or rh immunoglobulin you want to get so it is done for that okay so in this case there is hepatosplenomegaly they be born with that so it is hemolytic anemia of the newborn so that is the answer in this question now next 28 year old lady presented to the emergency department with complaints of pain in the right iliac fossa she had no episode of vomiting but there is nausea 
which of the following diagnosis is least possible? Ectopic pregnancy, acute appendicitis, left uretric colic, or PID. So this is uh, mostly a clinical case. Actually, it is a viva question. Okay, in cases of surgery or in cases of ops, gynae, what whatever it may be. So they have asked basically the differential diagnosis of pain abdomen in right iliac fossa. Pain abdomen in right iliac fossa, if there is a history of amenorrhea, then you will think of ectopic pregnancy as your first answer, amenorrhea, pain abdomen and nausea. Then it can be acute appendicitis because appendix is in the right iliac fossa. It can present as PID, although the in cases of PID, the pain is mostly the bilateral. So it's very, very common sense. Left urethra colic will present in the left iliac fossa. Why it should be presenting in right? So the answer to this question is left urethra colic. Which of the following is not true in the normal pregnancy? This is about the signs of pregnancy, which is in the first trimester they have written. Goodell signs of opening of cervix, vaccinic contractions, painless rhythmic contraction that is present throughout the pregnancy. Okay, this is correct. Goodell signs of opening of cervix seen at six weeks of pregnancy. This is also correct. Hager sign. Hager sign is seen at six to ten weeks, and Hager sign is false. Uh, Hager sign is. When you do bimanual examination, bimanual examination, two fingers are in the abdomen and one, two fingers are in the uh, vagina and you feel the enlarged uterus between the examining fingers. So Hager sign you feel that the uterus is enlarged and soft and cervix is empty. This is what is a Hager sign. So here which is written is perception of fetal movements. But perception of fetal movements is called as quickening. That is a symptom. Okay. So wrong answer here is Hager. Hager says uterus enlarged and soft and cervix feels empty because pregnancy is in the uterus not in the cervix. Okay. Jacumar or Chadwick sign bluish coloration of vagina. That is again correct. Okay, so this is what is a Hager sign. And what they have written? Perception of fetal movement, which is wrong. So it is Hager sign. This is Chadwick sign or Jacumer sign, where cervix feels congested and soft. This is bluish coloration. Okay, bluish coloration. Right? So you can see in this also this is Chadwick or Jacumar sign. So Hager sign is this. Next. Which of the following is not a feature of genital TB? Not. Genital TB 90% majority of the cases it presents with infertility. Majority of the cases, that is most common presentation of genital TB is infertility and 90% cases of genital TB is in the Philippine Jews. So infertility is an important presentation. Adenexal mass, yes, it can present as an adenexal mass or legomenorrhea, yes. So the genital TB can cause oligomenorrhea or it causes secondary amenorrhea. But polymenorrhea is never the presentation of genital tuberculosis. So I would mark polymenorrhea as the answer in this question. Next, which of the following reinfection to the mother does not affect the fetus? They are asking from the torch group of infection. So I would mark rubella as my answer because once she develops a rubella infection, if she develops a rubella infection in the first trimester, there is formation of IgM antibodies, but these are the large molecular weight antibodies that do not cross placenta. Okay, so from the Titus IgM, which says that she has recently got infection. So in that case, MTP should be considered because of the risk of congenital rubella syndrome. Congenital rubella. 
congenital rubella syndrome there is microcephaly mental retardation deafness congenital cataract congenital heart disease which is pda okay so this case is it's not compatible with life so mtp has to be done so once she gets an infection later on from igm there will be formation of the igg antibodies which can cause the placenta so next pregnancy if she gets a rubella infection again so already there are protective ig antibodies present which will traverse the placenta and can cause the protection okay so i would mark the answer as rubella which of the following is not included in third stage of labor uterine massage oxytocin control contraction after the signs of placental separation control contraction before the signs of the placental separation what was the exact question in the exam that the students are the better ones to tell nowadays active management active management of third stage of labor is being done according to the who guideline which says use of the uterotonics that is oxytocin is the drug of choice intramuscular bolus which is to be given okay after the delivery of the baby which will cause contraction of the uterus and prevents postpartum hemorrhage number 2 placental delivery placental delivery is to be done by controlled cord traction method controlled cord traction method number 3 there is nowadays a delayed cord clamping which is being recommended what do you understand by early or delayed early cord clamping means within 60 seconds if the cord is clamped delayed cord clamping means between 1 to 3 minutes the cord is clamped if you do a delayed cord clamping then around 80 to 100 ml extra blood can go to the baby previously uterine massage was included in the third stage management but nowadays they say when you are giving the oxytocin as a uterotonic after the delivery of the baby as early as possible and you're delivering the placenta by controlled cord traction method uterine massage is the part which is included in the management of atonic okay so depends what is the exact options given relatively uterine massage between 32 to 34 weeks of pregnancy what is the term early preterm late preterm moderate preterm early term so according to this let me mention term pregnancy we always studied from 37 to 40 weeks is a term pregnancy okay clearly we know this term pregnancy is 280 days or completely we say 40 weeks so it is 37 to 40 weeks pre term we say less than 37 weeks and post term we say is 42 weeks or 294 days okay so term is 40 weeks or we used to say range 37 to 40 pre term is less than 37 and post term is 42 weeks or 294 days okay so now if we subdivide it into term is 39 weeks to 40 weeks plus 6 days pre term is less than 37 this we know it is changed into or divided further into early or late pre term early is 
33 weeks plus 6 days and latest 34 to 36 weeks postum is 42. So we can say 30 to 34 weeks, we call it as early preterm. 32 to 34 weeks, 34 to 36 weeks, we call it as late preterm. So here the answer is early preterm. Okay, once more. Term is 40 weeks, that is 37 to 40. Preterm is less than 37 and postterm is 42 weeks. So they was early preterm or late. So 32 to 34 weeks is early preterm, 34 to 36 is late preterm. 